said fire in the hole and you're talking about the south i thought it was going to be a hot sauce so there's plenty of that down there too but hey if you think south and you think hot sauce then there's worse things you could think. i was <laughs> i was making a joke about fire in the hole jacob but i don't know it either didn't land or you just wanted to power right through fire i don't know if i yeah i don't think it did land. i mean hot sauce i get what didn't i get I, I don't know. It wasn't the rea- the this strong enough reaction. Joke. Yeah. <laughs> this is the banter okay. you wanted so bad. This is why you're like, <laughs> don't don't plan your bits ahead. Just have it feel natural. Welcome to the Voyage Podcast, a show that traverses the oceans of myth and legend through the lens of Catholic theology and philosophy. Come aboard as we set sail in pursuit of the heroic life and Christian virtue with your hosts, Mike Schramm and Jacob Platty. Yeah, I should. It's your fault. I should have just kept. We should have just let it roll. Illusion going. (laughs) Yep. So, welcome back to uh, this episode. As as enthusiastic (laughs) as that was, you sound so disappointed. It's defeat. Uh, I think the word you're looking for is defeated. And yeah, one hundred percent. No, no, no. You want to? You want to know how I uh, saved this one? I think your one? your t-shirt. Oh, uh, how? It's about time we started this episode of hey. the Voyage Podcast. So welcome back, Jacob, nice. and everybody else. To let's finally Bye, get started. It's about time. Uh, so it's about time. I know as if that joke hasn't been done a million times, but that's part of the, you know, it's, it's such a, um, congested topic when it comes to like pop culture. And so why not just throw our, you know, works into the, into the ring, so to speak, or I don't know, into the traffic let's just, jam. Let's just increase. We're the, just going to merge right increase in. Increase the saturation. Yeah. <laughs> of that, uh, overused element. Huh? So, well, yeah. So, I mean, I guess, and one of the things too is, um, because it is so prevalent, it's almost like why, I mean, why is, are, are people so obsessed with it? I think is a, a fair question to ask. And then what is the, um, you know, classical Christian element to it? But it's one of those things that even though it feels like every other movie or TV show has some sort of like uh, time element thrown in, um, this isn't like a new phenomenon by any means. And so what I want us to kind of do is maybe go back a little bit into the Back in time. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Let's just keep those coming. So <laughs> back to the future. So uh we'll we'll kind back of draw upon some of the the older manifestations of people's fascination with time. And what did Christianity, like Christian itself, how did it kind of break into this conversation? And then where have we kind of gone from there or what can it continue to say about people's fascinations with time? Does that, did any of that make sense, Jacob? Are you ready to talk about this a little bit? Uh, so yes. I mean, I think I follow like the words that came out of your mouth were sensible. Okay. Um, we're, we're, we're halfway we're, there. This is just about time. Yeah. yeah we're, <laughs> this is, this episode is just going to be a, just about time. Well, in we're both just talking about, time. it's about, it's about Kronos and about Kairos. Right. And when you say it's uh, about time, that means two different things when you're talking about Kronos and Kairos, but we'll get there. We'll get there in, t- wow. in good time. Hold our hands and lead the way there. Mike. So, well, first, you I, know, have you ever noticed how often the word time gets dropped? in just regular parlance because I mean, you're not even trying to make puns. We're no, not trying to, pun. I know it's, and we're not trying to be punny. Every time I hear it's it, it's just time. Yeah. Every time you uh, see, well, if this was a drinking game, people would be in trouble. Yeah, that's, that's true. So, um, so what I first thought would be maybe the, the gentler way to wade into these waters is to just go through some of our favorite pop culture examples because there are so many and they, I mean, they're, they, they're obviously entertaining. Like, they're con- because it's so present to everybody's experience. Um, we have all these questions or this fascination with it. So I don't know. What are some of your uh, favorite time characters or stories or movies or whatever? Well, obviously it's cliche, but Back to the Future is one of the best movie trilogies of all time. Okay, that's not. It's not just like my favorite. It's just objective fact. 
that the Back to the Future trilogy. Okay, listen. When he when it comes to trilogies, right? We there's a whole there's a whole episode. We could do a whole episode on trilogies. And I will say that Back to the Future, the trilogy. Yeah, if we're playing is not a drinking a game trilogy. about teasers, then uh, yeah, people are always in trouble <laughs> when you get stu- get talking because yeah, you're like right? we could do an well, episode on this. Yes. We could do an episode. On- you know what? It's good though that will continue will continue to exist, right? Because I'll just have to go back and oh, to the archives and say how many episodes did how many episodes did Jacob tease, and then I can just get started on work. It's it's a good like. <laughs> Uh, it's a good writing prompt. Sometimes I worry about running because so many of our topics tend to be really broad. It's like, we're talking about trees. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay. I'm waiting for the compliment um, at the end. <laughs> Go ahead. You're, you'll get there. No, yeah. But, yeah, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, but uh, it's like, man, is that too, are, are these topics too broad? Are we going to like run out of topics because like we we've talked about everything regarding trees in like a couple episodes but like that's not true there's so much to talk about we'll never run out of things it's a symbolic world out there we'll never just run out of things it is as as they say anyway you were going into back to the future i was going on about trilogies oh that's right all right so here's the thing yeah talk about broad but anyway (laughs) (laughs) that would be an interesting conversation you know just a conversation about trilogies as such it's almost as meta as a conversation about time but, Let's talk um, about the color red next, and then the number three. And then the, <laughs> I mean, to, no, and to be you fair... You could do a conversation yeah, about three. To be fair, there's a lot of symbolic value to both of those things. So I'll stop teasing you <laughs> and are. let you... You gave, <laughs> you gave bad criticism, critical analogies because both of those we could totally do episodes on. Um, but uh, it's not a perfect... I'm not saying it's a perfect set of movies. I'm just saying it's one of the best trilogies of all time. So it's like the the total is greater than the sum of its parts type of an argument, okay. right? Um, but Back to the Future, the movie, is a perfect script. Uh, and I'm not alone in thinking this. I probably stole that line from somebody else. But it is a perfect, super fun movie. And uh, Doc Brown and Marty McFly are forever etched into my childhood etched into the pantheon of pop culture, you know, heroes. Rick and Morty are obviously based upon them. Mm. But uh, I love those movies, and they're awesome. You know, when my dad first showed me that movie, um, I couldn't really get in. I couldn't get into it. I, I didn't grab me as much. And then he said, well, your kids are going to love it. You know, so, uh, <laughs> see? Uh, I did actually really see? like it. So <laughs> I, did, I did really yeah. like it when I saw it. <laughs> I just had to, you know, I had to make the, the, the joke, so... Um, it was a good punchline. So, good punchline. Uh, yeah. Get used to these bars, kid. Um, um, yeah. So, I, of course, Back to the Future. And and what I was um, going to say at first, too, is, well, the first thought is time travel movies. Um, and we can, of course, talk about time travel. Uh, it could. It doesn't have to necessarily be time, time travel in terms of important uses of time in movies. But I didn't want to... Um, you know, stop all that momentum you had. So we had uh, Back to the Future, like you said. There's uh, mm. um, Lego Movie Two, which is what's so funny about that one is it has that time travel element, but it makes fun of a lot of the time travel elements too. Which, of course, all the Lego movies are are very meta and um, self, um, you know, reflective or whatever when it comes to that. The sure, sure. Uh, Doctor Who. Why? Why? Because what is what's his like species, so to speak? Or I'll probably get in trouble for. Referring. He's a he's a time lord, yeah. and he is a him. That's right. Well, I don't even need to. <laughs> We're just gonna <laughs> ignore. I wasn't even the last three seasons. I I even I was even thinking I'd get in trouble for referring to it as a species, like time lord as a species. But either way, um, and then Avengers Endgame. Have you watched? Have you watched all the uh, not all of Doctor them, Who series? I've I've, I've started no. with the like the newer like reboot, um, which I don't know. That probably goes back to what twenty ten well, okay. or something. Um, when I said all, I was referring to just like the modern modern iteration. Yeah, but if I you mean all, back. is in going back to like the forties. No, no, that I, would be impressive. No, I have if, not. if I asked you, have you seen was, all of Doctor Who? Yeah, and you said that you'd seen the last eighty years of it. I would have been like, wow, you are a true super fan. So, yeah. Um, no, I have seen a lot of the old stuff though. Personally, I've um, I've uh. I started like, I think it was probably the first two seasons of the kind of reboot and, and then just either 
you know, losing interest and not wanting to go back or losing access because I think it was on Amazon Prime for a while and then it wasn't or, you know, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those where I think it's on. It's all on. It's on Max. It's on Max. Now. They, yeah, they just dropped the HBO. The Max so. now. So, um, the Max. So I, 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 yeah, I would, if I wanted to go back, uh, have access. But it's just one of those things that, yeah, haven't gotten around to it. So I feel like I've I've watched a fair amount of the... Let's see here. I, I know enough to get David the jokes. David Tennant. Yeah. I, I know enough to get the jokes. David Tennant was the second one in the modern iteration, yeah, right? Yeah, I can't and think of the first guy's name. And then he was followed by name. Matt. Uh... Eccleston. Okay. What was his Anthony? first name, though? No. No, I, I feel like it was either Chris or... What is that guy's name? Anyway, his last name's Eccleston. Okay. He was good. I, it was it was an interesting, you know, introduction. It's too bad he only lasted for a single season. But um, and then I've seen some of the David Tennant stuff, which followed. And I want to get through the rest of that and watch uh, the Matt's... Uh, who's the third one? Matt's... Matt something. He was in House oh, of the Smith. Dragon. I think it's only Smith. I think it's Smith. Matt Smith. Yeah, yeah Matt yeah, Smith. I, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, <clears throat> those those two seem to have made a tremendous splash. People really loved those two doctors specifically. Mm-hmm. And so I feel kind of like, well, I should at least watch the series run through them. Then after that, it was Cabaldi. Cap- Capaldi. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then after that, it's the chick. I don't, I don't know her name. So my interest, my interest wand, uh, but uh, yeah, Doctor Who or whatever. Uh, I mean, we could talk Time Cop. Okay, Jean Claude Van Damme about some deep cuts. So I mean, time, dude. There's so much pop culture time that's stuff. That's just it. Is that there's? Yeah, I mean, I knew that we weren't gonna. I actually, and like I said, I didn't want it to be purely um, time travel, even though that is probably the most like the most common one nowadays. Uh, but if you think too, like there's a lot of time elements that you would see. So for example, in the fairy tale Cinderella, she had to, she had to leave by midnight, right? That there was some magical part of time. And you, you see this in oh, other fairy tales too, but like there's something about right. The, this magical time where the magic runs out or the magic is up. Um, and so, yep. so there's of course a, an important kind of time element to that. The other one too is, and I don't, I don't know if it'd be like somebody's first thought about like a time story or a time fairy tale, but like the Rip, Rip Van Winkle, a man out of time yeah. uh, is very much. Oh, the, you went Rip Van Winkle. I was going to go Demolition Man. So. Okay. Well, <laughs> either way. Um, they're, they're both, they're, they're both classics, classics of the genre. I actually Rip thought. Rip Van Winkle and Demolition, to- Demolition I Man. I thought you were going to kind of like, what about me or um, actually me? Because there's a, there's a sort of a preceding story uh, that's similar to Rim Van Winkle in kind of the Eastern Christian minds of the seven sleepers of Ephesus. Are you familiar with that? Oh, are you, have you? No. Nope. Well, and just to, <laughs> you're going to have to school me up on some of my Eastern just lore. A very, I mean, very quickly paraphrase, but it's basically the Rip Van Winkle story, but it's these seven. Um, I don't remember if they're brothers or if they're just seven Christians, but they're seven Christians who were uh, escaping persecution during the Roman persecutions in early Christianity. Hmm. And they um, hide out in this cave and they basically fall asleep for like 200 years until the persecutions are over. And then they emerge from the cave and, that's kind of like the main thrust of the story. But it's what's interesting is you'll you'll see this in it's kind of like when people talk about the um the dating of the scriptures is they find old documents referring to this, but it's from all over the place. And so it's kind of mm. similar where it's like there's a lot of in one sense, it's either a really, really, really popular Christian fairy tale or there's something, you know, maybe a little bit more to it. And, um, yeah, interesting. So, yeah, I mean, just Google Seven Sleepers of Ephesus and you'll, you know, come across the Wikipedia page. I will have to look that up. But it's basically, like I said, Griffin Winkle is, yeah. Go ahead. Reminds me of an old Twilight Zone episode. Okay. Twilight Zone is one of my favorite. Another uh, one that has a lot of time, you know, related. Oh, there's so much. There are so many different. The first episode, wasn't it? If I just had more time, the when his glasses break. The... No, that's not the first episode. Oh. That is, uh, that's Mr. Denton on Doomsday, I think, is the name of okay. that one. Um, and that's a great, that's it's a, a great season episode, one. But yeah. That it's is, a classic one for sure. It is classic. It's definitely, I season one sounds right. Um, the very, very first episode is the guy, he's walking through a town and there's like nobody there. He's just like all alone. Okay. He's like, what is going on? 
And then should we do we twist? Do we spoil the Twilight Zone I mean, twist? It's only on been sixty years, turn- so. <laughs> yeah. uh, he's under observation. It's actually okay. he's an astronaut who's been given a like memory eraser thing. Yeah. And uh, they're they're testing him. They're observing him to see how he would do in like isolation. I remember. So I remember that episode. I just, yeah didn't remember that was the yeah. first one. But I mean that's 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 numero season uno. one that's and two are just Twilight yeah, classic. So mm-hmm. but anyway, um, uh, a lot so, of times uh, no. There there's too. an episode. There's an episode in the Twilight Zone, um, which uh, some robbers they go and they have this brilliant plan to steal a bunch of gold. And they go hide out in a cave and they have, it takes place in the near future. Okay. And they have suspended animation tubes in the cave that they've like planted there. And so they go and they rob all this gold and then they go and they sleep in the suspended animation tubes for a hundred years because it's like, see, there'll be there, there'll be no one looking for us in a hundred years, right? Where is the one place they'll never look for us? The future, blah, blah, Hmm. blah. Um, And then, they get out, and of course, at the end of the episode, gold isn't worth anything anymore. Oh. So, 100 years of inflation. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the 21st century, Twilight Zone. Gosh, it's... Um, it's eerily prophetic. So, you know, I <laughs> you wanted me to show this book. So, the funny thing about the, the book that I was talking to you about, The Simpsons Secret, is the whole phenomenon of how the Simpsons predict the future. And really, if you want to talk about predicting the future or having that very kind of prophetic, we've already done our episode of Prophets, but the prophetic mindset, the Twilight Zone did it first. The Twilight Zone had all oh, of those awesome. sorts of things of, you know, being able to see things in a way that others couldn't see it. And yeah, just, I mean, well, okay, I'll be the one to tease it. I now. mean, it's a little, it's a little off topic, but didn't in the prophecy episode, we'd never even bothered talking about there's a Twilight Zone episode where there's one of those little countertop fortune cookie that's like distribute fortunes. Uh-huh. Like you put a nickel in and it gives you a fortune. We never even brought that up in that no. prophecy episode, did we? That's one of the best. That's one of, that's a great Twilight Zone episode. It stars um William Shatner. Okay. Uh and uh it's it's even got a little devil head on the top. So it's they're in this little diner, they they're a cross country trip. And the car has to go in for repairs. And so they're stuck in this diner. And William Shatner's character is really superstitious. And he sees one of those little nickel fortune teller things. It's got a little like bobblehead devil on the top of it, Uh which really adds a lot of like flavor to the episode. Um, But he starts to obsess over the predictions that are being given to him from these little fortune cookie slips of paper that he's getting out. And then finally, like his newlywed wife, like, basically like slaps him or he doesn't she doesn't slap him but she like snaps him out like you know this is going to destroy our marriage you can't just sit here and like take instructions from a little piece of piece of paper and so they like walk out and live happily ever after then as soon as they walk out another couple comes in right after them and like gets into the booth and they're all like okay okay did you get the nickels and they all have like a they have like a ten dollars worth of nickels and they start like feeding it (laughs) And so it's like, uh, what would have Showing happened your to the William Shatner yeah. couple? Yeah, if like they hadn't like disavowed it and just went about their business and decided to take life into their own hands instead of relying upon a fortune teller. Yeah, thing. Very, I mean, it's very prophetic in like the true sense of prophetic, right? Where it's like speaking to that kind of eternal reality of you know how humans are or can be when it's trying to you know discover the future or or see the future, but then also the like living in like living in the reality and not always the kind of fantasy of, well, this is how it'll be if I follow this advice or do this thing or whatever too. So, but anyway, this isn't a I'm prophetic inspired episode. to go. It's not. Yeah. We'll get back. But like we were talking about suspended animation and things like that, uh-huh. which there's a bajillion stories along those lines too. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I actually, I haven't rewatched demolition man in like 10 years. Oh, I totally, now all I want to do is go watch Demolition Man. That is a classic, folks. See. Go watch Demolition Man. Sylvester Stallone and Wesley Snipes. Uh, and you didn't think that this being on this uh, podcast would bring any value to your life, but it's like, look uh, at what it's doing. You know, it's helping every you now and again. Every yeah, it's every now and again it proves its worth. Another. Um, you know. So again, two other examples that I, I thought would be interesting to talk about, and they're beyond just time travel. Is uh, so this would be in. in not so much fairy tale, but kind of fairy tale, but also in literature is um, the white rabbit in Alice in Wonderland. Cause what is he always saying right from the beginning of the story is I'm late. I'm late. It's like out of, yeah, I'm late. Yeah. And so you have or this very like, important date. 
So no time to say good hello goodbye. I'm late. I'm late. I'm late. I'll just let yeah. Any uh, yeah. yeah so. I watched that cartoon quite so, a few times when I was a kid. So uh, so there again, you have this kind of interesting way that time is is sort of brought in. Now it's supposed to be right a fairy tale, um, and regardless of how much weight you want to give it, like you know how much was Lewis Carroll even trying to like write literature, so to speak? And people kind of like I mean, there's been plenty of of commentary on the Alice in Wonderland and the kind of the nonsense that's sort of thrown in as, but also how it was thrown in on purpose and all that stuff. But it is just, you know, of all the, the symbols of all this, the, all the things, right. The thing that moved the plot, the plot forward was the watch because that's what moved the rabbit and the rabbit is what moved Alice. Right. And so, mm -hmm. so you can't say that it's completely arbitrary or that it like didn't like, it could have just been anything. Um, yeah. Well, you know what that also kind of makes me think of that's kind of time related without it being like a time travel device is, you know, at the end of it, she kind of wakes up as if it was all the dream kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and it's as if no time passed. Okay. Right. And so that's a trope that you see related to time sometimes. Narnia where, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because it's not just, you know, it's not just like people waking up from dreams. Like that's an easy way for a story to like tell a story without any time passing. Oftentimes, though, it can be more of like a fairyland mm -hmm. type, you know, so lots of fairy stories um, are all about time. Um, what's the word? That's not distillation. Um, but when time like is collapses. not operating the way. Or yeah, sure. There's a word I'm looking for that is similar to distillation but i can't think of it okay. it's not distillation but anyway it's uh it's time acts wonky mm -hmm. <laughs> time time gets stretched or condensed or vice versa a, a and, modern uh, example lots of fairy stories modern application of this is the um did you ever watch the tv show the good place where they talk about when your soul is outside of your body uh you don't experience time linearly you experience it like jeremy baramy have you do you remember that kind of joke from the show uh, I, I've not seen all of that show, okay. so I'm not sure if I've seen it. It would have been, yeah, episode. maybe closer, like probably one of the last two seasons of the show. So I think four or five is where they, they kind of get into mm. that. But, but again, it's, it's speaking to your point, which is that in this fairy world, whether you want to call it the afterlife, like the good place does, or you want to call it a dream or you want to call it fairy, it's time is not experienced the same way. And it actually mm -hmm. does kind of go in perfectly to one of the points that we are leading up to. We don't have to jump quite into it quite yet, or we'll say we don't have to go down that rabbit hole quite yet, but it Ayo. is the, uh, it is the kind of the, the, um, dichotomy between Kronos time and Kairos time and how uh. Kronos time and Kairos time, right? Alice is experiencing Kronos time in her regular life in her regular world. But then when she goes down the rabbit hole, right, following the rabbit who's following the clock, she is starting to experience Kairos time, right, in this fairy world. And that is one of the big things when, um, so you, the, uh, cause we we're talking a little bit about Dr. Who and, you know, you can kind of use the same idea when you're going, when you go into the TARDIS and all that stuff, but it's, it's playing off of this idea of the two times going against each other. And that's what all of fairy world, that's what Narnia was, right? Narnia was the kids were entering into Kairos time and they had left the world of Kronos time, which is why they could be in Narnia for years, right? Decades. But as soon did as you, they go back, it's like no time has passed. Did you already explain the difference between Kairos and Kronos? Did I just like zone out? No, no. I, I, I like had alluded to it that we were going to get, get into it. Okay. And so I haven't... <laughs> um, and I, I didn't want to like go right into definitions. I wanted to go into our examples. Oh, you don't want first. to get to it. There's so many. I mean, like, yeah. Uh, how about Star Trek? Star Trek has a bajillion time travel tropes in it and things like that. Sure. You know, there's one really, really good one from the original series um, that, uh, oh, I'm going to brain fart on the name of it now. But uh, Captain Kirk travels back to Prohibition era uh, times and he falls in love with a woman. Okay. And like the implication in the TV show is that like it's like the love of his life, like the perfect mate for him. Okay. But she has to die. Like she's going to she's going to get hit by a truck mm -hmm. in a tragic accident. And if she doesn't, then World War 3 erupts and um. like the entire federation, it's like the um what is the the <clears throat> what's that classic uh, science fiction novel where like you step on a butterfly well, and dinosaur so times and it changes the future it's actually, in catastrophic ways. It wasn't ways. a novel. It was, um, oh, I just, it short was, it was a short story by, by Ray Bradbury. 
and I'm blanking yeah. on the title of it too, but it's that literal thing where the guy they they go back in time to hunt Is dinosaurs. Is it the sound in the fury? No, that's a William Faulkner. That's a it's a line from Shakespeare, oh, but then yeah. William Faulkner wrote a novel about it. A delicate sound of thunder. Wait. Yep, that sound. Yeah, that's it. Um, it's something like that. No, that's so. I was just going. To, I was going to send you that <laughs> because I wanted us to the like, story. I was going to send you the story. Yeah, because I I was. Just oh. reading it. Well, anyway, I, I think I've read that story. Well, not as if you hadn't before. It's I like just it's it'd be like good. it's like future. It's like future tours or no past. No, tours. you go into the past like these little to, to hunt the dinosaurs. You want to hunt a dinosaur, and the guy gets scared, and so he runs off the trail, like you said, and he steps on. There's like you have to stay on the trail. Yeah. They've they've curated it perfectly, and not only that, yeah. but they've also observed when that dinosaur was going to die anyway. So when you hunt, when you shoot it. It's dying in You're basically the same spot. Death. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. yep. So, uh, but yeah, in the story, the guy steps on a butterfly and has, now it's not the same as the butterfly effect where the butterfly flaps its wings or whatever, but it's stepping on it, which causes this chain reaction, which they realize in the future too. No, it's a, it's a really, I Did mean, you, Ray Bradbury's, you know, science fiction is, is great. Yeah, it is. Well, I, just to put a pin in the Star Trek thing. So, Captain Kirk has to let her die and he has to like watch her die. Mm. Like the whole episode is him like struggling with this idea where like, f- like he can't change fate. Yep. That's every you know, time like travel if thing, he, right? If he saves, it is, yeah, yeah. If he saves the woman he loves, like his soulmate has to die and his soulmate is lives in 1930s America. Yeah, you know, So there's lots of weird philosophical, it's like, do we have soulmates? What well, if our soulmates don't live in the same time era as we do? You know, I like, have <laughs> I have romantic like seventeen and eighteen year olds ask me that question all the time, and I always tell them, "Yeah, but you're going to be disappointed about the answer. Your soul was made for God, <laughs> and your soulmate is God. So I'm, you know, I uh, you think it's your your boyfriend that you have now, but it's it's God. That's that's literally your soulmate. I thought you were going to say your soulmate is the person that you marry, and then they become your soulmate oh. because that's what the sacrament. They probably does. would like that too, but. That's the thing is like, well, anyway, we're not going to dwell on that. I don't think they would like either of those answers. No, they don't like my answer. And I <laughs> Because them like, it's not about like fate. It's about making your, well, that's you know, thing is living like, with the, within the sacrament of yeah, marriage. It's just, you know, toughing it out. I mean, you can tell I'm in a very romantic <laughs> mood because we just had our anniversary yesterday. So, uh, what? Yeah. Today is my anniversary. What? I mean, May is a pretty common month for it. So. <laughs> Hey, happy anniversary. Well, yeah, wait, wait, yeah, for, yeah, happy anniversary. <laughs> it's like, oh, well, it's pretty coming. Who cares? Thanks for ditching your wife for this. How about it? <laughs> <laughs> Me, on the other hand, you yeah, know, man. we spent the whole day together, but you, I mean, you'll just hang I out with the boys. I built my wife a flower bed. Aw. Did you? That doesn't did sound you use your, very your, comfortable. your man hands to, to literally build on to your life with your wife yesterday? Because that's what I did. Like with like kids? It wasn't mean, yesterday. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's. <laughs> I've been mar- um, how, how many years have you been married? Uh, it was My... 14 yesterday. 14. Yeah. Oh, that's cute. Uh, I'm at 17, so. Well, you're also significantly you know. older than me. So I'm surprised <laughs> you wanted to. Significantly older. I'm surprised you wanted to remind everybody <laughs> of that fact, but yeah. Significant. You know, time is relative, Mike. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, so, so, so it's funny. I mean, um, I actually was about to lead. So there's another, so there's a couple more examples of what's, what's interesting to me is so when people talk about like time travel or the, like, it sounds very sci-fi, which all of our examples so far have kind of fallen into that area, right? You talk about Star Trek, yeah. we talk about Ray Bradbury, talk about Dr. Who, blah, blah, blah. but what's funny is I've actually noticed in probably the last, we'll say 20 or 30 years, like not that I've been around f- to notice 20 years or 30 years ago, but that there are books and TV shows um, that are actually being marketed more towards kind of like the romance or like non sci fi audience that incorporate this. So, like, there's a there was a very popular um, book and then um, movie, and then they did try to make a TV series out of it, but it didn't, uh, wasn't very successful. But uh, The Time Traveler's Wife. Um, mm-hmm. fall, goes ac- along the same way. It, it actually is kind of like the Captain Kirk thing of the soulmates, you know, like going back in time. And yep. but, um, and then there's the uh, the Outlander series. And that one, he he can't even like it, it's it's unintended, right? Like he is stuck being a time traveler, and so like the main yeah, I the main problem of the the relationship is that she loves a man that she can't have in her life at all time because yeah, like he's that's like part like, of the conflict and then his experiences 
experiencing their relationship from outside of t- you know so that's a weird um, timey wimey things going but on but then um so there's time travels which is a, a like i said it was a very popular movie well probably going on 15 years ago now but um the outlander mm-hmm. series did you ever hear about the they they i've heard of it i haven't <clears throat> watched it i hear it's got real steamy scenes though yeah that's what all the ladies like well, to talk about so it's a yeah i mean it's a premium cable show so it's like you'd expect it's a premium cable. but um the book series was that actually goes back to i think 1990 is when the first one the first book came out so that's there's a I ton of them too i think um yeah it's it's there's a I few think there is i I do know because my wife reads. <laughs> there's like there's like nine or ten of them. <laughs> uh, I think she read Time Traveler's Wife too. Which again, when are when yeah. are you going to just admit that yeah. you are an absolute all outlander? It's, yeah, yeah my, it's all just my you. Wife reads, it's yeah. <laughs> Your wife anyway. is into this, right? We get it, Mike. We get so, it. So, um, which, well, moving on from that. So, what's interesting though is like. <laughs> It's not the, you know, it's not the audience when you, when you try to pitch a time travel book, right? A time book. Um, mm. that's, that's not, you know, you think it's more the like sci-fi sort of oriented crowd or whatever. Um, but it's interesting that it's kind of, it's veering into this area of romance, which I think is, you know, there's something to be said about that. Um, but it does, I think still go back to the, the, the kind of, um, conflict that we feel in our own selves between Kairos and Kronos, right? Because we have this sense of like, and it kind of goes to the soulmate thing you were talking about, but um, so Kairos, basically the the best, like simplest definition of Kairos is you can directly translate it to the word time, but what it really means is the opportune moment, the right time. And whereas Kronos Mm -hmm. is where we get, you know, the word chronology or chronological, where you were just talking about that time, like one second after the other, one moment after the other and how time marches on, right? When you say time marches mm-hmm. on, you're referring to Kronos. But when you are in the right place at the right time, you're talking about Kairos. Now, the hope in our lives is that they they meet up, right? You always want to be in the right place at the right time. But I'm kind of intrigued by uh, you given the technical definition there because I didn't necessarily know that, that detail. Of okay. it. Um, I would have said that uh, Kairos was like the quality of your experience, like the quality of the time. Sure. And Kronos was like the linear nature of time, right? And that would have been a perfectly fine, acceptable answer, but it's interesting to learn um, exactly what it technically means. Mm. It's like the right time. Uh, that's that's intriguing. Well, it's... In general, I, I think of it as just like the difference between having a really good time and time flies. Yeah. Like you don't experience the passage of time because you're in the moment and you're like having such a good time. Yeah. Um, it disappears. Uh, whereas if you sit there and you actually like watch a clock move. Speaking of watching a clock goes move. down. Speaking of watching. Are we not getting through your outline quick <laughs> enough, Mike? No, I, it actually, it was just a perfect segue that you totally derailed. Um, <laughs> my last example of Roads, time. where we're going, we don't need roads. <laughs> Go on. So, uh, where, um, a, another great example of time that is used but not just for time travel is the hunger games you remember catching fire the okay. arena i mean i remember the it. arena is a clock and oh. so there again like time became this like ever present figure to the characters but not in the way that you would expect and mm. for them okay. it was very much about kairos and chronos because if you were in a certain place at a certain time something was going to happen to you. And so they had to kind of weigh like the, you know, but they also had to figure out and measure the chronos of when these things were going to happen. And so you got to see it kind of play out mm. with these, um, you could say deadly consequences. If you are familiar with the book and, and the movie too. Um, I mean, that analogy feels a little bit tortured to me, but um, I guess I'll let it Was roll. that a joke or are you? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> I, I thought there's you could put up that uh, that analogy felt a little like forcing children into uh, oh, <laughs> match to the death. There it is. But yeah. I'll let it roll. All right. <laughs> God. I mean, <laughs> so where are we going next? Mike? Gosh, I thought we didn't need any roads. So uh, yeah. So the after going, you know, after going through all those examples. Um, and talking a little bit about Kairos and Kronos. So what is the sort of like Christian element or, or kind of like Christian connection to this? So where this idea of Kairos, where we actually see it in the New Testament 
is in Galatians 4.4 4, when Paul is talking about um, when the fullness of time had come, he was born, a, born to a woman born under the law. And so we get this sense of yeah. Kairos is entering into Kronos. Okay? And, mm-hmm. you know, and, and Paul sees it in the person of Jesus. And so for Christianity, go back to what we were talking about before with like Alice in Wonderland and the, um, uh, and kind of the, the fairy world is we're living in Kronos right now. And it's like, we're breaking into Kairos, so to speak. Right. Or entering, not breaking into, but mm-hmm. like they, they fell into it accidentally or something. Um, and so that's sort of, it's kind of like that in reverse, but now Christianity is, is sort of like trying to kind of tap back into that. Does that make sense? Or is that another tortured no. analogy too? <laughs> A little less torture. You're coming out. Sw- you um, came out swinging today, as if you weren't the one who skipped our first appointment. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, time was not on my side uh, today, Mike. But um, the uh, <clears throat> see now you derailed me. No, I was going to say liturgy, liturgical calendar okay. stuff. So, like when we talk about um, the nature of the church here, we talk about the nature of our liturgical services and things like that. You know, we're always, we're playing with this idea that we're transcending time. We're entering into eternity. Another, uh, you know, concept that basically is a kind of sister concept mm-hmm. to this conversation of Kairos is eternity as such. Yeah. You know, eternity is not a never-ending linear chronology. Eternity, that's just not what that's it means. That's just another chronos. Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, like eternity, where, where God is, um, the domain proper to God is not linear. It's, it's not chronological. Um, and when we talk about being with God for eternity or in eternity or whatever, we always say for eternity, and it, it implies a kind of chronology again and things like that. Mm. Um, and I do think that it's very, that, you know, if we're talking about the actual experience of like dying and then going to, um, you know, I guess you'd call it like the, uh, oh, what's not the final judgment, but the particular uh, judgment, particular judgment, things like that, right? Yeah. Or perhaps from a Catholic perspective, this the question of purgatory or things like that. You know, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how literal to take references to chronological time when we're talking about that experience. Mm-hmm. My suspicion is that the experience of life after death, after we leave our bodies, right, um, is one in which we're entering into a reality that's outside of time mm-hmm. until the the general resurrection, you know? And even then... I don't know if there's like a specific answer for what the new heaven, the new earth will feel like or operate like, what type of physics, what type of uh, chronology will be appropriate to the new heaven and the new earth. I just, well, I don't, you know, maybe you know something that I don't, but like... Well, uh, even referring to it as a chronology, that might even be like, the whole idea might be that if chronology is a um, is a created thing, just like the physical world is, then even that is going to become wholly subject to like, it's, it's not going to be, um, there's not going to be this disconnect between creation and the creator. Like there is after the fall and creation includes chronology includes physical time, just as much as it includes, you know, mountains and the oceans and planets and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Time is a part, you know, like, and I kind of, I'm surprised that this hasn't come up yet. I guess the nature of the conversation has been such where we just kind of played in pop culture for a long time. Yeah. But, um, you know, St. Augustine has a really famous line talking about time mm-hmm. where he says, uh, let's see if I can paraphrase this well. You know, if you ask me what time is, I know exactly what you're talking about. If you ask me to define time, I realize that I have no idea what time is. Mm-hmm. You know, I kind of butchered that paraphrase a little bit. No. But he's yeah. saying like time is something that we intuit, but time is not something that's easily defined. I was actually in a conversation with... um Actually, it was like an atheist type once, and I was trying to make the point that there's lots of things that we experience qualitatively that are not um, uh, definable. Like they they cannot be um, spoken easily of, right? But we all know it's true. We all know it's there because we all we all experience it. 
And time was an example I gave Mm -hmm. where it's like, you know, you really can't define time very easily, but we all know what it is, but we all personally experience it kind of thing. And he thought I was crazy. He said, what do you mean you can't define time? Time is, you know, sequence of events kind of thing. And it's like, yeah, you haven't, you haven't thought this through. It's like, I, I recognize that time in some sense is a measure of motion, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like what he was getting at. Um, Physical time. But it's like, yeah. Well, okay, but fair enough. Like, what if you really get into this? You really you begin. It kind of begs the question. It's like, how do how does anything move at all? Mm -hmm. Like, what is what is the substrate? What is the the essence of of nature as such? The essence of creation as such that it's not just a block. Yeah, that there's actually like you know time. It's like well, time allows things to move. It's like, okay, time allows things to move. We can make a statement that says that. What is time? Yeah. It's like uh, the thing that allows things to move, the measure of things. It's like, okay, but like that doesn't really exhaust the question, mm-hmm. does it? I mean, like it, it, it gives us something to like put our hat on. It, it, it's a kind of a descriptor, it, but you're not really describing time at that point. You're describing like what time allows. Yeah, it's it's like it gets it gets pretty meta, folks. So you know, ponder on that for a little while. But yeah, no, Saint Augustine talks about this. Well, that's just it. Go read some Saint Augustine. Well, and it's and it's it's in his uh, probably his most accessible work because it's in the Confessions where he has that quote. Um, Because he has one of his his books in it is a just a reflection on time, like you were saying. But uh, yeah, because it's one of those where what's ironic about that, and like you said, you were speaking with somebody who. probably in many ways would identify with a kind of like materialism when it came to to the mm-hmm. world. And so what's ironic is, well, if you start talking about like, like you said, is it just the measure of change or is it just change? Then you start to say like, well, okay, if it's only change happening within this kind of closed system, then is it just tied up with, is it just another physical thing? Is it just another material thing? But that's where it starts to, you know, make less and less sense too, because nobody would, even though we have material things that measure time, that's not the same thing as, you know, the time itself. And so it's, it's immaterial. It's, I find this type of thing, it gets exciting for me personally, because it begins to unlock the magic of the reality. It begins to unlock the, the profound mystery of like how life functions, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, just start digging. Start digging into these really rudimentary basics of just like how things operate. And you begin to realize just how how ill-definable um, our, our lived experience actually is, right? For all the things we can say about stuff, right? I, we've, we've had thousands and thousands of years to say things about things. And we've said a lot, well, right? And but it has not exhausted the mystery. To that point, you know, you're saying we've been talking about this. We we actually have been talking about the um, relationship between Kronos and Kairos for thousands of years because we have in Greek mythology we have the struggle between Kronos and his children that goes all the way back. Mm-hmm. And it's not just he's not just a character in a story. Because they could have named that character anything, but the fact that the tit- it's the titan called Kronos, where we get the word chronology and chronological, is the one who tries yeah. to devour his children and then is the one that is usurped or overthrown. And so why would the yep. Greeks recognize that this is, in a sense, the, the, the titans were a um, more fundamental reality than the gods were? And so you right. have the time that oh, that oversees all of the physical world, right? Because Kronos is the father of Zeus, the god of the air. Kronos is the father of Neptune or Poseidon, the god of the sea. And so you have mm-hmm. this over, you know, the, this overarching Titan. But it's not a, um, it's it's not a, uh, I guess, um, what would you say, like charitable relationship or or no, no affable, it's antagonistic, yeah, right? not an affable yeah. relationship. And so they've always, we've always known this as human beings, that there's this struggle against time. And now what did it mean for the Greeks that they had, you know, Kronos's children eventually rise up and and defeat him? I mean, that's, that I think is interesting, Mm -hmm. but that's sort of what, when you were talking, when we were talking about how St. Paul says, you know, Jesus, who from a Christian standpoint is the eternal, it's eternity breaking into Kronos, breaking into that 
chronological time. That's, that's that same struggle, right? And you can yep. almost say yep. like who wins in a sense. And you jumped right into exactly what I, I wanted this to be about too, which is the liturgy. So I'm here for it. Is us going, it's us, we're, we're exiting Kronos and we're entering Kairos, right? Yep. Which I think would be interesting too, if we want to talk about Narnia, how was, was the kids going into the wardrobe? Was that liturgical? But we, we got to leave that aside for now. But, uh, <laughs> but that's the, that's sort of the, um, you know, and like we've talked about too, this has been present independent of Christianity because we've always had fairy stories. And so we've always had people who leave Kronos and enter into Kairos in some capacity. Now they were always maybe dismissed as, well, that's not real. That's just make believe or that's just fairy stories. But now we have, it's not us trying to work our way into Kairos. It's Kairos has come and broken into our world, broken into our Kronos, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. The, this is the idea that, um, and we 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 break into Kairos a every week, right? One of my favorite little tidbits that I discovered early on when I was like looking into classical Christianity and things like that was this old tradition of referring to Sunday as the eighth day. Yeah. Um, uh, in other words, it's it is simultaneously the beginning of the week, but it's also the day that transcends time itself. It's it's past the seventh day, mm. and if you get into biblical numerology, yeah. you know seven seven is the number of completeness, right? You know seven days of creation, things like that. Um, but then the eighth day is the day that transcends even that. So you wanna right? you wanna uh, see a little, or you probably are familiar with this symbolism too. But in a lot of baptistries, um, the mm. the the uh, baptistry is shaped like an octagon because it has the eight sides. Hmm. And so you'll see that eight sides. So you'll see in a lot of, I mean, this is the, the, um, the parish that I, I remember growing up in the parish that we were members of, um, at one point, like you'll notice this, if you start looking for it, that a lot of the baptistries are shaped like an octagon to have those eight sides. Oh, I can immediately, for yeah, the eighth day. I can see it for sure. But it's also cause you have, the, you have the eight people in the new creation after the flood with the flood being that kind of type of baptism. And then you have Noah, his wife, mm-hmm. the three three sons, and their, uh, each, each of their own wives. Oh, so you have the eight people too. But yeah, Easter was the eighth day of Holy Week, right? Because you start with well, Passion and Sunday going all the way to... And this idea of the liturgical calendar, all right, so wait, it's on a weekly... On, on the one hand, it's on a weekly cycle, right? Um, it's also on a festal cycle with all the different um, feasts, some of which move... Um, according to the lunar calendar, some of which are um, chronological. Mm. Um, but there's there's you have kind of elements of both Kronos and Kairos, even in that, in the sense of the feast. Some feasts kind of belong to something that's not tethered down, not clamped down to time, and then others that are, right? Mm. I think there's something to that. Um, I know that, practically speaking, it is just because of the different calendars, like... Um, metrics that are used to define when they're supposed to be celebrated. But I don't think it's a coincidence that you have both kinds of holidays, both kinds of holy days in the liturgical calendar, Mm -hmm. some of which will always be the exact same way every year. Mm -hmm. December 25th will always be Christmas, right? But Easter fluctuates, Mm -hmm. depends upon, you know, when it's going to happen kind of thing. And it gives a little bit of variety to the liturgical so, calendar each Speaking year. of Christmas, speaking of Easter, and then um, I know we've kind of talked about the, the shirt I'm wearing already. This is my Pentecost shirt. So I think this is the case in, in <laughs> Your Eastern. Your Pentecost shirt. Yeah. See? Uh, I need a Pentecost well, shirt. So I need, a, I need a shirt for each For the feast high day. feast, yeah, high holidays. Um, yeah. But why I bring those ones up is because, and I, I thought, I think this is similar in, in Eastern Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. Do uh, you guys have an octave where you celebrate the day of like Christmas day, the feast and the nativity, but then you celebrate for seven days after it, which makes the entire octave. You have like December 25th. And then the seven days after is the Christmas octave, That's which true. is like one long yeah. Christmas day. And then we have the Easter octave where you have the Easter Sunday, but then like in our church calendar, it's called Easter Monday, Easter Tuesday, Easter one, like it goes because it's one long Easter. It's an oct an eight day Easter. And in the, yeah. in the older Catholic calendar, um, they would also have a Pentecost octave. So like right now, because we had Pentecost this past Sunday, um, this would be Pentecost Tuesday, or we'd be within the Pentecost octave this week. 
because it's the end of the Easter season too. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think they had one for... No, I mean, I know for a fact we have Bright Week after Pascha. And I know for a fact that we have the the Christmas season, basically, from the 25th up through Theophany. Yeah, Octave is Latin, so so you guys probably don't call it that. But It checks out. Yeah. Isn't Octave also eight? Like it's it's that's why it's called octave, right? It's eight. Yeah, octo. no, that's. But I'm saying it's Latin, so you guys probably don't call it that. No, I I know. I, I yeah, get that, but yeah, it's it's it. it's Latin for um, eight because it's the eighth. Like you know, there's eight tones too. There's like eight octaves. Okay. <laughs> Details. Trivia. <laughs> Are we playing cash cab right uh, now, or what? Is that? <laughs> is, is that? Um, well, there's it's just the, you know the music of the spheres, right? I mean, come on. Oh man. Okay. That. Ah, uh, see. There's now seven I'm interested planets, again. You and got, then you there's got me back. Yeah. Got ah, me back. Yeah. Right. So. Um. But uh, you know, it's funny. Dante has it something. All, it, about it's that all. Too. <sighs> anyway, moving on. So. Uh, uh, so no, it and then the liturgical calendar also obviously uh, resets every year, mm-hmm. right? And so we're constantly playing with this idea of basically like timey wimeyness, you know, like yeah. where we're always being represented, we're always being presents um, for the first time all over again, mm-hmm. um, you know, every every Sunday, every every high holy day every i you know it's it's all it's circles within circles spheres within spheres kind of it's thing. a new opportunity um, to symphonic. re-enter into kairos right like every sunday is but then also okay maybe i was in a different season of life during this christmas or during this mm-hmm. um you know during this pentecost but i'm at a i'm at a different season now and i can enter into it more fully for whatever reason right we i mean mm-hmm. my yeah. wife and i talk about this when you know and as you know bringing a one year, almost one, right? Thomas is almost one. Uh, he turned one. He turned one a um, couple weeks back. So mm-hmm. just a couple weeks um, ago. Yeah. But yeah, when you are bringing little kids, you know, to to divine liturgy to mass, you don't feel like you can enter into the kairos as easily, right, or as fully. And so you're in that diff- you're in that season. Whereas you know, as you but you get that I mean, opportunity. Speak for yourself, Mike. Yeah, my children are perfect angels. Yeah. So are they all? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry to hear that you're having such like a hard he, time. Like he's like Saint Nicholas out the I womb. Say? He was already uh, fasting. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's my kids. I'm that's a nutshell. deep cut. What can yeah. I say? So, um, yeah. Uh, so, so each liturgical cycle, like you said, is is an, a new opportunity, a renewed opportunity to enter into, to escape from Ka- Kronos, to enter into Kairos. But the whole idea of the Christian is that after leaving the liturgy you are bringing that Kairos with you into your, you know, Kronos, into your day-to-day world too. And um, mm-hmm. there's one more, so we kind of, um, not that we glossed over, you You mentioned Easter, you mentioned that, but actually, and like I said, I, I don't say this as if this is like exclusively to Western, you know, Catholicism or anything, but we have a term called the Paschal Mystery, which is, again, another example of this like collapsing of time because, uh, so the other example from the Bible that um, I wanted to kind of talk about was, um, so you have the Galatians 4, 4, the when the fullness of time had come. But do you know in the Gospel of John, Jesus will many, many times refer to his hour. So if you think of like the um, John chapter 2, the wedding at Cana, he says his hour has not yet come. I think it's later on in John 12 where he says the hour of the Son of Man. Like, you know, kind of just what I'm alluding to or referring yeah, to? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. So, and, and again, from a... Christian standpoint, you're like, well, he's referring to his sacrifice, right? No, what's interesting though is, well, that wasn't just one 60 minute hour. And so, because actually the idea of like 60 minute hours, that goes back like long, but that goes back to the Babylonians long before, you know, Jesus's time. Sure. So you get the sense yeah. of, and plus, even if that wasn't the case, you'd be like, well, why did the translator translate it to hour when, you know, we know what a concept of an hour is. So you have to ask yourself, why was this word hour being used over and over? And why wasn't it, it's not just referring to Kronos hour. It's not just referring to six minute hour. And so one of the things that we talk about when we talk about the Paschal mystery in theology is that Jesus's hour wasn't just one 60 minute segment of him being on the cross, or it wasn't one 60 minute segment of him at the last supper or 60 minute segment of him at the, um, you know, uh, on trial or 60 minute segment of mm-hmm. him being in the tomb. It was all together one hour. It was one Kairos hour, right? When we go to 
the Last Supper of him offering his body and blood at, in the Eucharist. Then it's the him mm-hmm. offering his blood on um, in the uh, Mount of Olives, the uh, agony in the garden. It's him offering himself at the trial. It's him offering himself, right, carrying up the cross on Calvary. It's him offering his spirit on the, at the cross as well. All of those are included. And so you think that's not just obviously one 60 minute hour. It was all collapsed together, including his time in the tomb and his resurrection. And so, mm-hmm. so um, when we use that phrase, Paschal mystery, and this is what we talk about when we, um, cause we talk about, uh, there's the, uh, there's a segment of the mass called um, uh, Mysterium Fide or mystery of faith. And so it's, it's yeah. us acknowledging that all of these things are being collapsed into this moment at the mass. And so we're seeing, again, this is another example of how the liturgy is supposed to take you out of Kronos and put you into Kairos because that's what happened on, during Holy Week. That's what happened is, is he, just like Kairos had broken into Kronos, now he was bringing Kronos into Kairos, right? He was making our chronological mm-hmm, time sure. fit. And, and so that's why the liturgy is, like you said, us being able to step into eternity, us being able to kind of uh, return back. And so we, we have those moments, right? Just go looking mm-hmm. at the, um, the passion, looking at Holy Week, but uh, we're supposed to kind of like re-enter that every Sunday or every, every mass, every divine liturgy. Yeah, for sure. No, it's uh, honestly, the older I get, and this is an interesting phenomenon, um, the time moves fast, the older you get, right? If you don't stop and look so around once in a while, you. you could admit, oh, that's a different, that's <laughs> life moves fast. That's, <laughs> I had pay off, uh, Ferris Bueller, yeah. Well, you know, he was saying the same thing. Uh-huh. Right? He was, he was talking about Kairos mm. because he used the word life. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, it's weird how quickly life goes. It's weird how quickly time moves and things like that, especially the older you get. And eventually it's, you know, and this is just kind of like a, an old fuddy duddy thing to say, but it becomes less and less of a kind of imminent reality to me. Um, it's like a, a time-lapse video where you just like watch the, the sky rotate constantly, you know, the sun and the moon, the sun and the moon, the sun and the moon kind of thing. Yeah. That's uh, honestly kind of what my life feels like a lot of the time is where like I'm just kind of like moving through life and like the sun and the moon are just kind of like circling overhead. Um, and a while back, I I, I kind of just stopped worrying so much about the chronology of things, mm-hmm. right? Because um, it, it, I can't stop it. it. You know, the weeks fly by, the time flies by. Um, and I've kind of rested in just like living in the moment, living in the immediate now kind of thing, Mm -hmm. which has become kind of a cornerstone of my entire kind of outlook in life. A lot of that is really coming from the Christian tradition, Yeah. right? I mean, and you find that type of, uh, reality in all kinds of like wisdom cultures around the world. Um, uh, Taoism is very much into this, right? I think even Buddhism is kind of into it. Um, I suppose at some point, all religions kind of get to the same idea. But certainly within Christianity, I think when Jesus is talking about things like, don't worry about tomorrow, tomorrow's going to worry about itself, right? Mm. When he's making these explicit statements about, you know, how you should be viewing things, right? Or when St. Paul is talking about not being attached to this world, but being transformed in like the renewing of our minds and things like that. In some sense, at, at a rubber-meets-the-road kind of way, they're talking about kind of disabusing ourselves of this rat race chronological mentality yeah, and entering into just like be alive right here, right now, doing your relationship with Christ in the moment, and the rest is going to take care of itself. Mm-hmm. And so, I don't know, the older I get, it's just time becomes really weird. Not to mention COVID really messed things up. Okay. I don't think like we've ever recuperated from like the idea that like, because I, well, I should say personally, I stopped going to the office, right? So yeah. now I work from home a lot 
And I'm telling you, without having like the rhythms and routines of like a five day work week mm. that it used to be, like going to the office, time gets real weird. Yeah. So I mean, the last couple of years have really doubled down on this this experience of reality that I have, where it's like I don't even know what time is anymore. Like I'm just kind of like I'm just kind of like living in the moment, bro. Yeah. <laughs> kind of just like living for the now. So COVID made so. you a hippie, is what you're saying. That's. And that's that's exactly what it did. You're gonna be oh you're like COVID and Jesus. Yeah. Oh geez. So <laughs> well, yeah, no, and I think and that's one of the and actually we didn't even get into the um the what's called the divine office or the liturgy of the hours, which is another example yeah. of the Hilarious, the ancient frankly. monks that what they were basically trying to do is they were trying to bring Kairos into Kronos through the through prayer. Right. When we talk about how yeah. their day was organized by it was by the hours, but it was it was the hours of prayer, like each each hour or, um, you know, like third hour, sixth hour, ninth hour, they'd be designated to have a certain prayer. And then, of course, Vespers and, and Matins and all that stuff. So it's like that's another um, that's an I was going to bring Dante into this, but I'm not going to do it. I promise. But uh <laughs> We did talk about, like, because we talk about, I mean, when he talks about this, you talk about the seven heavenly spheres and, you know, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But but that's, again, like, it doesn't take becoming a monk to live like a monk. And it starts with the, the, the Sunday, like, liturgy, but then it's about incorporating that into the rest of the day. And you were saying how, like, when your work schedule was, in a sense, you're sort of like... Um, almost, in a sense, your, your liturgy from Monday to Saturday or Monday to Friday. And then when that got disrupted you had to like reorient yourself and not that, yeah. not that it necessarily means that you take on praying the office. Cause I think people who are, are living and working in the world, that still is a difficult thing, but it is about establishing that, you know, it's, it's how are you bringing that, the, the fullness of time into this chronological time. And well, now I feel called out for not praying the office every day, Mike. Well, that's fine too. She was. <laughs> <laughs> then I won't tell you that I don't either. So, yeah. <laughs> so, and actually we didn't even, I mean, we didn't even get into like circular versus linear views of history, which is very much part of that time conversation. But, um, yeah. but we talked a little bit about during our prophecy episode. Yeah, no. And I think it's, and, and certainly something we can go back to, cause I think I do want to have us do like a, a, a Bible timeline episode because you kind of see a little bit of both of those. You see like the ancient cycl cyclical view, which I think you can't even call ancient anymore. That's almost become like the postmodern view of history too. It's like the anti-Christian versus Christian views of history is secular right. versus linear. But a hundred percent. Yeah. Because secular is, is, is pure pagan. Right? Yeah. Not that Christianity hasn't baptized it, but Christianity is the one that that even introduces a countervailing narrative, right? Yeah. Prior to the end of time being a concept, there is no concept at the end of yeah. time, and so in in pagan like culture cycles, there's well, and it's it's kind of funny. Just I mean, forever. you know, to go back to your um, conversation with that materialist friend or colleague or acquaintance or whatever like that would be an interesting thing where it's like if you don't even have a concept of time and yet it's because you're so immersed in this kind of cyclical view it's going to make time feel like it's not real and it's not so much mm -hmm. that time isn't real so nothing is right because that's the very common alternative it's more if this version of time isn't real then what is the realer version and as we both recognize it's eternity like that's the realer you know in a sense you know i guess version yeah. of time Anyway, we've I've I kind of took us down another well rabbit trail, and we're both are we, late. Are we running out of time? Oh, <laughs> Denzel Washington movie. Uh, no, uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, well, um, it's about time we wrap this up. So thank you, Jacob, for nice. for joining me with this for this uh, conversation. That like all of our conversations, it could branch off into fifteen other different topics, which I'm looking forward to. Uh, you making I'm time just to surprised talk about. we didn't exhaust. I'm surprised we didn't exhaust uh, all the different references that we could have brought into this oh, episode. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry. There's plenty of time for that too. So, and thank mm -hmm. thank you guys for uh, coming in and joining us and listening along. And um, just want to encourage you to go to iTunes, leave a five star rating, and uh, leave a positive comment for Jacob because he's really feeling like uh, he doesn't he doesn't have enough encouragement in his life. And so he really needs, you know, something nice said about him from, because I'm beginning he doesn't, to feel he does, he knows like that. I've experienced this before. He knows that. Like this is a, a secular 
timeline yeah, it's, and that I'm just back where I started. He's wearing the same back hat every ended. day that we record. It's the same <laughs> same background. So it's like, is any of this real? Different he shirt. needs to experience something different. So, And he, he knows that it's gonna not, not going to be sincere if it's from me. So he needs to hear it from somebody else. So. Wow. Yeah. That was a real clever end. Good job. You, you nailed it. <laughs> so dry. Thanks for listening to Voyage Podcasts. The Voyage Podcast is a production of Voyage Comics and Publishing, which seeks to create exceptional entertainment informed by Catholic values that inspire people to live a heroic life. Voyage Comics seeks to advance truth and beauty found in powerful stories. To learn more, visit voyagecomics.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. 